All right, up for gear review this morning is a Mac 1700 stereo receiver. Uh, these are manufactured between 67 and 73. Uh, 40 watts per channel. Uh, dimensions and weight were flashed up on the intro slide. And um, I think I have on there that uh, it's without the cabinet, right? So this actually has a cabinet with it. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about the cabinet on this versus the uh, the Mac 1500 when I did that review. So in terms of the series information, so we had the, um, the way it went. So when this was sold, right, uh, this was uh, one of two, actually one of, two receivers at different times that Mac was selling at once. So you had the 1500 and the 1700 overlap, I think by a year or two. Then you had the 1700 and the 1900 overlap by a year or two, something like that. But if you look at Macintosh, at least what I'm, con what I'm considering their vintage receivers, right? You had the 1500, late 60s, the 1700, bridging the late 60s and the early 70s, the 1900, which was the early to mid 70s. Um, and then you had the 1200 stereo tech. You also have a 4100. I don't have any experience with those. I won't be doing a gear review unless one happens to cross my bench, which is kind of unlikely at this point. So, but today we have the Mac 1700. Um, these came with or without a cabinet. Now, and actually two different cabinets will fit the Mac 1700. And I'll talk about the cabinets. Hopefully I'll remember to talk about the cabinets when I'm talking about pricing. Um, this is actually the L15 cabinet. So this is the one that would actually fit the 1500. There's also an L19 that will not fit the 1500, even though you'll see online that they say the L19 fits both the 1700, the 1500, and the 1900. So, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a little more detail when we get to pricing information. So they came with or without a cabinet. That's the that's the whole point. And this is the older cabinet. And I I believe that I saw something date stamped 1971 on this one, but I don't know if that was a date stamp or not. Um, it would make more sense that this was a late 60s because of the cabinet that's with it, rather than the early 70s. So I'm I'm guessing this is actually more a 68, 69, 67, somewhere around there. But I, you know, unless you can find the date stamp or something stamped on there, it's hard to tell. So in terms of the aesthetics, you can see this is uh, very similar to the Mac 1500. Uh, the main difference being, at least aesthetically from a distance, right, this this part here is is black. The Mac 1500, it's, it's, a, it's metal or it's light. Right, um, the dial face is very similar. You have the Mac uh, logo here and the model number. You have the FM dial. Now this is FM only, just like the 1500. This is tube FM, <clears throat> excuse me, just like the 1500. Don't ask me about tubes or I'm not gonna, you're not gonna ask me. Well, you might ask me in comments. I have no idea. You'll have to look up in the service manual what tubes are in here for the FM section. Um, so you have the, uh, the dial. Right, so very, very similar to the 1500. The actual knobs are, almost, I would say, identical. I, I, I don't know if they are for sure identical. There, there may be minor differences. I have a 1500 and a 1700. I should probably just look. Um, but you, you definitely get that mid-century modern vibe like you do with the 1500. The sound, very balanced. Um, less tube-like than the 1500 because that has a tube... Um, uh, preamp, right? Or no, it's a tube uh, tube amp on that and then a, a solid state preamp. Um, but this one is all solid state. Very, very balanced Macintosh sound. I mean, it's just very, very... It doesn't, to my ears, it doesn't bias towards either being too clear or too warm, right? So you have cap coupled receivers, very, very warm and mellow. You have... Um, Direct coupled receivers, especially the late 70s, or like non-switching amps that Amplifier, that uh, Pioneer used later on, a little bit more on the clear end, right? So this is really kind of a, a balance between the two. So it's, it's a great sound. I, I love the sound of, uh, of old Macintosh stuff. Oh, I love the sound of Macintosh stuff. 40 watts per channel. <clears throat> In terms of uh, 
using this. So the hookups can be a little bit confusing. These did come with two different types of speaker terminals or you could upgrade to a different type of speaker terminal. On the back I'll show a couple of images, one from this and then I'll grab one from Macintosh's website to show you the other type of speaker terminal hookups. Excuse me. <clears throat> You know, I do these videos first thing in the morning after I have coffee and then my voice gets raspy. I don't know why. Um, I don't smoke, but it's almost like I have that smoker's, you know, phlegm in the morning, which I, I'm sorry, that's kind of gross. But anyway, uh, hookups can be confusing. Using it is pretty easy. So you have auxiliary tape, FM Auto, Phono 1, Phono 2, Tape HD. I explained on the Mac 1500, this Tape HD is not a line level. It's kind of like a Phono. Right, so you don't want to plug a line level into Tape HD on here because it's not going to sound right. You have balance. Now this balance, I have it about in the nine o'clock position, and I'll talk about why that is on this. But um, I have uh, you have balance. You have stereo mono, filter in or out, tape monitor in or out, muting um, out or in, loudness out or in, speakers on and off. Now on some of these. You'll see on later models, you'll have a remote, right? So you'll have, um, if I remember correctly, and maybe I'll snap a pic, you have um, two sets of speaker. So you have like a main and then a remote. So you can actually have two sets of speakers connected to it. This, if I remember correctly, um, or at least there's some kind of different speaker selector here. But again, this is an older one, only one set of speakers. You have split, bass, and treble. And I think on some of these, it's not split. So again, if I, as I'm editing the video, I'll include hopefully an image or two of one where these are not split. And so when I say split, right and left channel, different um, bass or treble uh, uh, levels. You have a volume control, which is also the power. And the reason why this is turned to the nine o'clock position is because this one suffers from the dreaded um, uh, channel imbalance or mistracking. This has the original potentiometer power control. And um, as explained in earlier videos, what happens on these two, one of two things happen. <clears throat> so you have a shaft, you have two wafers, right and left, right? As you turn the shaft, these wafers can get a little bit loose on the shaft. So as you turn, let's say the left is loose. When you turn the right, the left is trailing behind it, right? And sometimes to balance it out, you've got to then kind of turn the knob in the opposite direction to get them to line up. So that's one reason uh, why these mistrack. Another reason is the carbon tracks <clears throat> for right and left channel. Um, there's, a, there's a coating on there from what I understand. And if you use the wrong contact cleaner or just over time, the tracks will wear um, unevenly. So you'll have a greater or, or you know, lower resistance for the right or left channel and that will cause the channels to um, to not track. So what's weird is on some of these, you turn it up and here it's balanced and here the right is louder than the left and here it's balanced and here the left is louder than the right. It just depends on what is going on with it. This one, the wafer is loose. I tried to go in and I tore this apart and I tried to glue it um, just to kind of to reinforce it. But um, when I did that, in my mind, I had it aligned a certain way, and, and what I did is I basically just ended up reinforcing it to the mistracking position, and it doesn't matter to me. Um, they sell aftermarket pots. Uh, the quality of those can be um, in question. So, and then uh, I've replaced two pots on Mac 1900s, and the two pots mistrack as well, and that's a very common thing. If you go to Audio Karma and you do a search for... Um, uh, replacement pots for like the 1700, the 1900, the 1500. You'll see that even gear that you get or parts that you get from Macintosh can also have issues like brand new out of the box parts. So, um, and I did contact Macintosh. They don't have any pots for this. And again, it's mine and I don't care if this is unbalanced. And again, you know, the, the room that this was in, one of the speakers was shoved in a corner. So it's a little, it's a little bit different. So anyway, right. So the use is easy, right? But and when I get into what to look for, I'll, I'll talk about that um, in, in a little more detail as well. But pretty easy to use. Serviceability, I would say this is, a un, this is a, an intermediate for sure. Um, there are unique parts that are not available on this, 
right? Also on the 1900, also on the 1500. Macintosh used part numbers. So you have to look up the part number and then you need to figure out what it was. And sometimes you can reach out to Mac and they can give you uh, some idea on a replacement. Sometimes they ignore your question when you ask that. <laughs> so I've got responses from them to those questions and then I've been ignored when I've asked those questions. So I usually just go out to Audio Karma and see if, what people are using to replace, let's say, a transistor. Some of these will have um, a transistor that's wired as a diode, and I talk about that in the eBay Mac 1900 video series. So you never kind of know what you're getting into, what you can find, what you can't find. The uh, topology the and uh, the way this is connected is going to be similar to the 5100 from what I've heard. I haven't worked on a 5100. I'm looking for one. Right, but this uh, this does not have the boards that slide in and out like on a Mac 1900. It makes it nice to be able to pull those boards out um, and service them. Right, the printed circuit boards, but the connecting slots sometimes will get a lot of oxidation, so you have channels drop out, and it's one more thing you have to service or clean later on. So it's kind of a mixed bag. But this one um, on the bottom, it's pretty much point to point wiring. Um, and then you've got a couple of PCBs up here that aren't really in the best position. Um, you can get to them, you can work on them, but they're kind of a pain in the butt, like the preamp boards. Um, and I haven't been in this one for a while, but I, I have worked on uh, a couple of 1700s, so I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with them. And then on some of these things are reversed, so like, um, I don't know if this is one of those, and I don't even want to go around to the back, but sometimes... Like you'll have amplifier boards mounted. So this one would be the right channel, even though it's on the left side. This one would be the left channel, even though it's on the right side. Speaker hookups on these are also reversed. So don't assume that the two terminals on this side in the back are the right speaker and these two are the left because they are reversed. So you have to keep that in mind. And when you're servicing this, depending upon what you're servicing, Right, You may have boards where you're like thinking you're working on the left side because you're physically on the left side of the unit, but you're actually working on something that is a right channel, right? The right side. Um, luckily, the documentation <clears throat> for Macintosh gear is pretty good. So I appreciate that. Uh, the 1500 and 1700, they're kind of old school service manuals. Um, so a uh, little fewer, fewer illustrations. Right, but um, their their owner's manuals. You can still go out to the Macintosh website and download an owner's manual for one of these, and they're really really cool to look at and just kind of you know uh, read through. I guess uh, look at the pictures. You know, uh, so the documentation is really good. So what I look for on these when I if I'm looking for for one to pick up, um, number one, does it have a cabinet? Right, so cabinets on these. I know I'm kind of skipping ahead, but cabinets on these add a couple hundred dollars. You can find um, both aftermarket and original OEM cabinets, right? Now on the 1700, it doesn't matter whether you get the L15 or the L19, both will fit. If this were a 1500, the, the 19 cabinet will not fit the 1500. So you, you do have more, you have two different cabinet options is what I'm getting at. Um, very few of them are intact, at least from what I've seen. This one has a, a wood kind of lattice on the top, and it's all warped and bent to hell, and there are big chunks missing from it. Um, I mean, from the front, it looks okay. It protects it, I guess, somewhat. I, I can do something with that, but I don't really care, so so I haven't on this one. Um, so if you're, if you're looking for one with a cabinet, you, you know, definitely you want to make sure you get the right cabinet, and for this it's easy, and make sure it's in good shape. I think the biggest telltale sign on whether it's a 15 cabinet or a 19 cabinet, the 15 cabinets use wood, right, instead of a metal mesh, right? Um, and then the 19s use uh, a metal screen or a metal mesh. So the big thing is glass, right? You can sometimes get glass from Audio Classics or from Macintosh, depending on if they have any available. I have found that Macintosh lately has not had anything for 1700s. I don't know if they do it in batches once per year, or if they just don't have any right now, or they're never making it again, I don't really know. So the big thing is glass. Um, make sure all the knobs are here, and I've mentioned this on the Mac 1900. So when I bought the potentiometer, the power volume potentiometer, 
I gave them the serial number off of one of the Macs. Well, I had two Macs I was working on, so I figured I would buy two of these pots. Well, the two pots were different in terms of the shaft alignment. So when you look at the shaft, it's kind of like a, like imagine the letter D, right? And then the knob goes on and it has a letter D cut out and it aligns to that pot. Well, on one of them, the letter D was as you would read the letter D, kind of like reading, right? The other one had the, the letter D where it was kind of laying on its side. So, um, and I'm talking about the opening on the knob. Well, the potentiometer both had the letter D as it would be upright. So when I went and put the knob on the one where the letter D was kind of laying down, instead of the off position aligning to the little tiny groove here, the groove was way up here at the top. I didn't realize that they used different part numbers for those two different receivers. Now, I don't know if that's true on the 1700, but it's something you have to look out for if you're looking for a knob. Because just because someone says, I have a Mac 1700 knob, does not mean that it's going to be aligned with whatever you have going on here, right? And I just found it on the 1900. I don't know if it's true on the 1700, but you don't want to assume, right? And then uh, have a knob where it's, where it's not going to point where it's supposed to point. You can fix it. And I went in there and I broke the epoxy and I moved it and did some other stuff to it to where it's aligned now on the 1900. But it's just something to, to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Uh, the other thing, these little switches, you, you don't want, I would not want to buy one of these with a switch that's uh, broken where the, the little slider portion is, is busted. Um, unless they're, unless it's like maybe broken halfway and they are providing the other half that you can glue on later. Um, these might be hard to find. So knobs, cosmetics, glass, kind of the typical stuff. Um, if it says that it's not working, this one does not use jumpers. I'm going to, sorry, you're going to see me just for a second. I want to see. Yeah, this one does not use jumpers in the back. So you're not going to luck out and get one of these that isn't working cheap, right? Just because somebody doesn't have jumpers on it. The 1900, they use jumpers uh, between the amp and the preamp. So, um, and then, you know, speaker terminals on these seem to lead a rough life. So it's not, it's not uncommon to see that they are damaged in the back. So, um, you know, just want to, you, you want to really give it a, a really good, uh, once over before you pull the trigger on buying one of these. So those are the things I look out for. And then, um, make sure they have a picture of it on. Um, if they have a video where they test sound, that's sometimes okay. You know, um, and I have the eBay Mac 1900. I go into that and how the seller was kind of sketchy on that. Um, and then, you know, from the top, uh, if, if they're taking a, a picture from the top, make sure all the covers are, are where they're supposed to be. The tubes are in for the FM section, you know, those types of things. Um, okay. So in terms of prices on these, so I've, I've had this one for several years. I got it out of smoking, smoking discount considering it came in the cabinet. It was four parts. Um, one of the filter caps had shorted. So it was a really easy repair. Um, I think I got this for like 350 bucks in the cabinet in decent shape. But again, that was probably two, two years ago, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. But to get one of these, so let's say this was restored in the cabinet. Maybe there's some boxes or documentation or whatever. You know, you're looking at probably uh, $1,500 or more. Now, naturally, you know, and as I always do, I'm going to flash up some crazy prices. People are asking for these. You know, I think at, at the time I went to kind of do the research for pricing on this, somebody was asking like 2,500 bucks for one and didn't even come in the cabinet. So I think that's insane, right? And I don't know that it was restored, right? Now, if you send this off to Audio Classics and they do a restoration, because those, they know what they're doing. I would, I would be less hesitant to spend more than 2000 on one of these, even if it didn't come in the cabinet, because from what I understand, they do phenomenal work, you know, but there are going to be very few sales where that is going to be the case. So typically it's took it to a local tech or a shade tree tech like me, and somebody did some work on it and it sounds good and it looks good, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, 1500 bucks. And again, with the cabinets, plus or minus $300, $400. For a reproduction, um, L15, there's a company that has one. I don't know if they produce these all the time, but they want about four. 
Um, you can find the cabinets, the different model numbers on eBay. Typically the 19s come up and they're about eh, between three and 400 bucks. So again, you have to factor that into price if it doesn't have the cabinet, right? 1500 for one of these working in this condition in the cabinet, because I have recapped this. Um, without the cabinet, it'd probably be more like 12, right? So the cabinet plus or minus a couple hundred dollars. Uh, to get one working, so so this one, so the prices that I'm giving are, are it kind of depends on, you know, what's going on with it. So when I say working, maybe it's been serviced but not recapped. Again, that's kind of what my working is. Or I hate to say tested because what did they test for? You don't know what that means. And really service, you don't know what that means unless they're specific. But to get one that is conceivably working and in okay condition and maybe some work has been done to it, probably a thousand bucks. Right, so around a thousand ish dollars. I would probably, because I recapped this one, if it wasn't in the cabinet, I would probably sell this for around a thousand dollars if I were selling it. With the cabinet, I would, well, I would keep the cabinet for my fifteen hundred. But you know, if I were to to sell it with the cabinet, it'd probably be maybe twelve. Right, this definitely would not be a fifteen hundred dollar unit just because of the cabinet uh, condition. For parts on these. Um, I lucked out on this one. I got it really, really cheap considering the um, uh, the condition, the overall condition. You can find these for for right around five hundred bucks, under six hundred dollars. But man, some of them are in really, really rough shape. So you've got to be careful uh, when you're when you're looking to pick one of these up for parts, and you really need to look at as many images as the seller provides. Uh, because uh, for some reason, Mac gear was really, it seemed to be really prone to oxidation and, and corrosion and rust. So look at the pictures of the boards. If you see parts that have oxidation or corrosion or rust, you, like on the eBay 1900, you'll see what I found to be a problem on that. And it was a transistor that actually had rusted legs, right? So um, you want to pay attention to things like that uh, if you're looking for one of these for parts. And naturally, if it's got cracked glass, if it's got knobs missing, if it's, you know, the, this is probably not going to work 100%. I mean, even if you spend a lot of money on one, it's probably not going to be working 100%. So you've got to factor all that stuff into it. And then, you know, your level of comfort, if you're going to work on it, um, great, right? You'll, say, you'll save money. It'll just be your time and then the parts involved. But, you know, if you think you're going to score one of these for 500 bucks on eBay and then take it to your local tech unless you've got a really good relationship with them and they're going to, you know, restore it for $200, I, I think you're out of your mind because there is a lot of work involved and the parts are expensive. The caps, the filter caps on this alone are like $100, um, depending on where you get them and, and, and if they are available in this size. So, um, you know, you just have to factor all that stuff into it when you're looking at one of these. Um, I really love, I love the Mac 1700. It was the first piece of Macintosh gear I got. The second I listened to it, I thought it sounded different. I really liked the sound. Um, you know, I'm a Macintosh, not a fanboy. I do like Macintosh gear. I think old Sony is every bit as good. And to be honest with you, maybe a little bit better, but I'll save that for another video at some, at some point. And I'm talking sixties Sony gear but uh you can't go wrong with a mac some people aren't down with the the aesthetic some people think they're kind of homely um i think they sound great right um very balanced sound so can't go wrong with a mac right especially if you're a little handy uh so anyway i think that's going to wrap it up for the mac 1700 as always if you like what you see hit like hit subscribe and i'll catch you in the next video